Good morning. I'm uh, Terry Williams. I'm uh, from the Keene Sentinel. And my job these days is mostly being in charge of audience and community engagement at our paper, um, which mostly encompasses fundraising for our newsroom and building support uh, for journalism in this community. I'm joined uh, in the Radically Rural Community Journalism track uh, by Jack Rooney, who is our managing editor for audience development. And he's going to be taking over a number of my roles in 2024. And I've just been delighted to be working with Jack and organizing this event. It's been a terrific help and, and has provided some amazing ideas. Jack and I hope that what we've planned the next couple of days will be helpful to all of you as you try to navigate the challenging world of being a community journalist, uh, to perhaps increase the impact of your own initiatives and help all of us build more sustainability in our operations. Radically Rural is a partnership between the Hannah Grimes Center for Entrepreneurship and the Sentinel. And this is our sixth summit. Tying journalism into a summit like this one may, may seem a little bit strange because a lot of these oftentimes involve economic development, uh, land use, uh, arts and culture. But can we really have sustainable and thriving communities without great journalism being practiced within those communities? Um, and, and that's what this is all about, is to make sure that community journalism is part of um, the rural experience and to, and to do as much as we can to advance the, the mission of community journalism. I am certainly not going to lecture you on the importance of local news. You know all that. Um, but we need, to, we need new and proven solutions for our future. And those answers can come from folks who are seeing success and at least maintaining their newsroom resources. And a good number of those are with us for this summit. Many of you are here because you have started news organizations in regions devoid of local news coverage, or because you are providing news for communities of color or underserved populations. Some of you have worked at organizations that have attempted to downsize their way to profitability, and now are literally ghosts of what they were once. Still others are at more traditional news outlets trying to figure out if there is a sustainable or more sustainable way to do things and a few more student journalists eager to make an impact. We are, to one degree or another, all in the same place, working toward providing impactful, important journalism at a time when it has never been more critical. This summit is yours to make the most of through the experiences of our panelists, the networks that you can create here, the inspiration to be entrepreneurial and bold, and maybe of most importance, a little bit of time to breathe. So breathe. Before we launch into our first panel, let me just cover a few housekeeping items. So restrooms are out of this room and to the left, around the corner. Uh, coffee and water is available, as you may have seen when you came in. Uh, the Wi-Fi password is up on the screen. If anyone has any general questions about Radically Rural and neither Jack nor I can answer them, we have a help desk inside the Colonial Performing Arts Center on Main Street, where most of you started your day. Immediately after this session, I encourage you to grab a bag lunch outside and return quickly for a wonderful presentation by Dr. Jeremiah Arias on his experiences photographing the plight, the past, and the progress of rural Kansas newspapers. Following the professor's presentation, we'll have another session in this room focused on philanthropic efforts, membership, and other ways to support newsrooms. At 4 p.m., the Sentinel will host a mixer for all of you. Uh, it's just a short walk um, from here, and I hope you'll all um, join us. And then around 5.30, we'll be heading on a bus to Stonewall Farm here in Keene for the Connect event, which is a fusion of great local food, drink, and music. You are all on your own after Connect. Take the bus back to town. Enjoy some of the local night spots with some new friends. Or if you really must, you can catch up on some work. <laughs> I'll have some other announcements later today, um, but I do want to acknowledge the support um, of a couple of sponsors that, that make this possible. Uh, the Franklin Pierce University's Marlin Fitzwater Center of Communication has been a track sponsor of Radically Rural now for some time. Um, we're deeply uh, appreciative of that support. We also um, have uh, 
Franklin Pierce University students that are covering this event. You may have heard Juliana talk about this this morning. Um, they go out, they spread out, they cover all the tracks, they cover Connect, they cover the main sessions, and they all come back to the Sentinel um, and uh, file stories. And we, we assemble a, a newspaper um, that, that, that features all of their work, the photography. Uh, we print that early tomorrow morning and then we distribute it um, to all attendees and all of the Sentinel readers get it as well. Um, we also are supported um, by the Knight Foundation, and I, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that Knight um, is underwriting the attendance of 13 rural journalists from all over the country here. Um, the program shows some of the bios of these folks. They're doing some amazing work um, in small communities around, around the country. Um, we're delighted to have them here. Um, we're going to learn a lot from them. Hopefully they'll be able to take some ideas back from us as well that, that help them um, in their work. But the Knight Foundation um, um, has been extremely supportive of Radically Rural over the years. Uh, Duck Liu, um, who is uh, the director of um, uh, sustainability initiatives in journalism for Knight, will be with us later today and throughout the rest of this conference. So we're delighted to have him join us. So the demise of local journalism in rural America has received national attention. But in more places than you think, small news organizations are thriving. Our panel discussion will give you insights into how three news organizations have evolved to secure a brighter future for themselves. Chris Baker has been the publisher of the Taos News since 2000. Baker and his team in Taos published more than 25 niche magazines and guides. Niche revenue is the paper's most significant revenue stream, grossing more than a million dollars annually. Baker was inducted in the New Mexico Press Association Hall of Fame in 2018 and was president of that organization in 2004. Lindsay Young, along with her husband Joey, is the majority owner of Kansas Publishing Ventures, which oversees the publication of three weekly newspapers, the Harvey County Now, the Clarion, and the Hillsborough Free Press in South Central Kansas. As part of a university study, they have recently experimented with alternative revenue streams, including e-newsletters, events, and a reader membership program called Press Club. Tristan Scott is managing editor of the Flathead Beacon in Northwest Montana, where he lives on the doorstep of Glacier National Park, lucky guy. <laughs> he also edits Flathead Living, a quarterly lifestyle magazine, and Glacier Journal, an annual field guide promoting outdoor ethics and etiquette at one of America's most popular national parks. Most recently, his editorial leadership has helped guide a small community newsroom as it pioneers new pathways to sustainability in print and digital journalism. Each of these folks will give you a 10 or 15 minute overview of their operations and some of the endeavors that they are making that are having key impacts on their missions. If you have questions, just ask them um, at any time I'll keep the conversation going following their presentations with some questions of my own. Um, but this is very much, as I mentioned, a summit for you folks. So, and um, I'm thrilled to have these three with us. They're doing some amazing work. I'm anxious for them to share their experiences. So with that, I'm gonna ask Chris to begin. Now we're gonna be playing a little musical chairs here. We have one laptop, but three presentations. So we'll, <laughs> so pardon the shifting around a little bit. So with that, Chris, take it away. Thanks, Terry. I appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. So, as Terry said, I've been at the Taos News, um, I think it's 23 years now. And uh, we do a lot of niche products. Uh, we're family owned and operated since 1959. Our sister paper is a Santa Fe, New Mexican, which is the second largest daily in the state. We have a 9,000 print circulation, about 120,000 unique visitors. Located about a, an hour and a half north of Santa Fe, tucked up in the deep in the mountains of New Mexico. Um, elevations at 7,000 feet. And we publish a lot of magazines, um, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, our tourism website is discoveredhouse.com, and it's close, closely linked to our print product, which is Discovered House magazine. Uh, kind of a fun fact, just north of Taos is Wheeler Peak, and at 13,161 feet, it's the highest point in the state of New Mexico. So. Um, we do a lot of visitors' guides. We do a lot of uh, best of magazines. Um, I have a real estate guide that's very healthy. Um, our two visitors' guides, these two, this is, comes out in the 
summer and our winter guide. Um, obviously, come the winter, and these two combined are six hundred thousand dollars and and such. But I don't want to talk about these guides. I want to talk about guides you might, or sections or magazines you not might, may not be aware of that are really, I think, in my opinion, are doing real well, in, in, especially in our community. Um, people ask me, why, why do you put out so many magazines? What's, what's the story behind that? Um, doesn't that dilute your news product? That's, what, you know, this is, you know, I go to my peers and other publishers say, Chris, you, it's crazy to devote all this time. You're just um, pulling resources from, the, from the, the main paper. But our, our business model is kind of different. When we do our magazines, we may make 30 cents, 40 cents, up to 60 cents. I got a map that does 70 cents on the dollar. And that fuels my newsroom. I have a strong newsroom because we put out a lot of magazines and we own these franchise. Um, and it continues to grow. Um, it's, in, our, in our little paper, we circulation roughly 9,000. We have 10 people in our newsroom. We have a full-time photographer, full-time copy editor, full-time uh, special sections editor, full-time web editor. And the reason we're able to do that is because we have this great magazine franchise, and that fuels our newsroom. So we have a strong, a strong franchise because of that. So it doesn't take away from the paper. It actually builds on it. Um, so my first magazine is Taos Woman. Uh, and I want to do, I, I want to present magazines that can, hopefully can be done everywhere um, in rural markets. We're about as rural as it gets. Uh, Taos Woman is we've been some, something we've been doing for the past, I don't know, 13 years. It has, uh, I have a good little show and tell for everybody. It has um, a circulation of 20,000 copies. Everything we do with our magazines is in front of our paywall. So if someone wants to see it, they can get into it. And then hopefully that will entice them to maybe subscribe and find out other things about us. Um, we have a community luncheon where we honor eight women of impact. And the women of impact that we have, they pick next year's winner, women of impact. People say, well, why do you choose it that way? I don't want people saying, well, we just pick our advertisers or people we like. The women that we picked are, are honorees. And they love picking the honorees more, more so than even being honored for the event. Um, we have a live Facebook event. We have it on TowsNews.com. Everything we do is, is, is um, on, on live streamed. It's $56,000 is what we generate. Not a lot of money, but um, it's a good chunk of change. We have 25,000 views. And every event we do, we get sponsorships. So this one's not a big one for us, but $10,000 from, from the Taos Community Foundation, University of New Mexico, that helps to put on the event and, and really helps to entice it. What I find with events, you have people that might have abandoned the paper, that may, may have not read the paper forever, whatever. And you might get some young people that say, hey, this is kind of neat. I'm glad you guys are doing this. Um, I didn't know the paper did stuff like this. And so it's just a really way to make your footprint bigger and help, help get you a, more presence. Okay, so our maps, and people say, why are we doing a map? You know, we have Google Maps, we have, I don't know, 10,000 ways to find different maps. Um, but our map, our map is great, it works fine. It, it, mine got a little beat up on the plane right over here. But this is what it looks like when you, when you see it online. I always say fiber, cyber, you have the, the fiber part of it plus the online component. We print actually 235,000 copies. We're a huge tourism market, obviously. We rack and stack it throughout northern New Mexico. It's printed on 60-pound enamel gloss, and we have 125 count. We can get more than 125, but after some point, it just gets too cluttered and people can't see it. We learned that the hard way, I guess. Um, and we break the billing down for three installments for small advertisers. So this little map, of 70, 75, 000, close to $74,000. This is, this is the, the fiber part, gives you an idea. And then on the back side, we have an actual key with everything. Um, my artist is, is, lives in Canada. He doesn't even come to Taos. He does it all through Google Maps, and which we like that. And uh, again, now you're saying, well, I can't do this in my market. We're not a tourism market. But I've done this in liberal Kansas. I've done in Seguin, Texas. They're not tourism markets. And it works great. You may not pull 74000 but you could pull fifty to 25000 And we also do an enchanted circle map, which is an area about an hour from us, a whole little towns outside our area. We do another $20,000 20, with this map. So the two maps combined close to $100,000, and um, it really helps the bottom line. Um, this is kind of neat. We actually had Google Maps finding people reading our map, and then we use this for house ads <laughs> to promote it. 
so we, we tell two people, when people, we're so rural, when people use Google Maps, they get thrown off in the middle of the mesa or they might get off a cliff. So that's why our map has a lot of attraction too. Okay. Um, success stories. Success stories in alvatorial format, um, branded content, sponsored content. I guess we were doing this before branded content was cool. I guess it's the, the theme now. Um, this is something that can be done, again, in every market. Um, it appears in the back of our A section. We sell it for 12 months. Starts in January, goes all the way to December. We put it on the back of our A section. Real affordable for small accounts. And afterwards, they get a, a, a glass frame with it, and they put it behind their cash register. And we see this years, decades afterwards. Hey, there's, there's a success story. It helps us with publicity and helps them. Um, the profile is one of the top stories on our website. So we have a lot of cross-pollination between our website and social media, and revenue generated for this is $82,000. So a great place for a business if they have an anniversary, if they have um, a new product line, they want to pat their employees on the back, and that little gray area at the bottom is, our, we call it the honor roll, and if you click that, it goes straight to the website. So this is a wonderful, easy, simple way to make some extra money, um, and it's more sponsored content or branded content. Okay, land, water, people, time. So. I, we found this oh, about 13, 14 years ago. Um, culture guides are great. Um, I mean, our visitors guides make a lot of money, but if you want a really a nice product that helps bring in not only your readers or re people that constantly read the paper, but new people, people that are visitors too is, is great. Um, it's fantastic. It continues to grow. We love um, highlighting the various cultures. We have a large Hispanic population, large Native American, Anglo. And there's so many stories. I mean, I mean, where we're at now, 17, 1799, where the Sentinel was founded. I mean, the, everybody's got history in your market. I don't care where you're at. And you can really do a great job on this. I, I don't, you can talk about going down that darn mountain a million times skiing, but it gets old after a while. This is something completely different. It's completely enriched. And everybody gets excited about it. Um, we do it in two counties below us where we don't even distribute the paper. So we go to Reba County, which is south of us in Santa Fe County. Um, we rack and stack it. We use certified rack display, which is a competitor of mine. I use, I use them for everything. Um, they put four or five of my magazines out and they distribute throughout these counties. But we generate $74,000, we receive $20,000 from two sponsors. And I, I, I don't care where you're at, where, how rural you get or you know what where you're located at this can be done in any place so I love we talk about the languages the different areas we have nine northern um, Indian pueblos in our area and they love it just it's just a great enrichment for the for the community okay okay gallery guides so the we do a, a wonderful gallery guide it's great for a little tourism market um, it's small. We actually sell the cover of this for $4,000, but you're saying, you know, we don't have galleries where we're at. How can that work for us? And when I say what, whatever you, whatever encompasses your community, when I was in, in um, Kansas, when I was in liberal Kansas, it was Dorothy's house, the Yellow Brick Road, the Wizard of Oz, and we did a section behind that, and that's something you can do anywhere. In, in um, Seguin, Texas, it was a pecan capital of, of Texas, and we always did something on pecans. So our thing is galleries, it's art, tons of art. Um, it's, it's real small, fits in the purse, fits in the back. And it's $109,000, 60,000 60, copies, 13th year, putting it out. So the night before it comes out, we have a little uh, wine and cheese thing at, at one of the galleries. Everybody comes out, um, and then they see this the night before it comes out. So it's a real popular. If you do have a tourism market and you do have galleries, I suggest doing it. Um, but if you don't and you have something that's whatever your niche is or whatever is popular in your community, it works very well. All right. Um, Traditionis. Traditionis is something, oh, I've done it 23 years in Taos, and I've probably done it um, two other markets. In the past, there was progress editions. I think progress editions are dated now. They're not, I mean, maybe some people just still do progress editions. What we really do is, again, enrich yourself with the three cultures of northern New Mexico. Um, we have a community event where we have nine unsung heroes. We do our citizen of the year. We receive $20,000 from sponsorships. Um, our event is next Wednesday where we have 200 people. Before COVID, we just had to do it remotely and just um, have the honorees. This is... This shows you the event. This is before um, before COVID hit. We had 350 people at the event. Continues to be a wonderful 
popular event for us, grows every year. Um, and then that night, everyone gets a copy of the edition with the Unsung Heroes and the Citizen of the Year, and they take that home with them. And then the next day's paper, we have the actual section in it. So again, this is something that can be done everywhere. Um, we tie everything we can into events. I, I, I think when four years ago, I might have had one event, and now I'm up to, I think it's seven or eight events a year. Every time we do a special section, we do an event. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to do events. You have to put it on. You have to get, you know, uh, the venue. You have to have uh, the catering or whatever. But it's, it continually makes us better. It's, it's a lot of work, but if you, I, I think we're all doing events at some point. But if you're not, I think you're, you're kind of missing a boat. But all these sections, are, I, I try to pick up sections that we can do at any market um, and just tailor make it to make it work for you. Okay. Lindsay, yeah. if you can switch chairs. <laughs> we'll do musical chairs real quick. So I'm Lindsay Young. Uh, my husband Joey and I uh, own Kansas Publishing Ventures in Kansas, and we are not legacy newspaper folk. Uh, a little background for us is we met on the college debate team, nerds, and <laughs> I was a sophomore and the editor of our community college newspaper, and I needed a sports writer, and Joey thought I was cool, so I got him to write for me. Um, we ended up kind of drifting apart for a while and I decided to kind of leave journalism and, and went in, into teaching and Joey fell head over heels in love with it and started freelancing for a local weekly who then ended up buying the newspaper which was actually my hometown paper that covered the town where I was teaching and so we reconnected and got married and Joey went off to work at our regional daily and I was still teaching and Joey got stuck on the copy desk and was working second shift and was completely just miserable. And so every day when he was home by himself, he would start scheming. <laughs> and as you know, all newspaper guys are schemers. So he would scheme and then I, I would come home and he'd be like, here's my new business idea. And I'd be like, eh, okay. So one of the things he did unbeknownst to me was call the owner of the paper that he had worked for that when we had gotten back together, we reconnected and said, hey, will you sell me your paper? And he said, no. And so Joey said, OK. So I kept trying more ideas. And then pretty soon, the guy called him back and said, yes. And so then Joey said, hey, friend, guess what I did? And I was like, what? And so we suddenly were saving. We moved all of our money into us just living off of one salary, and we just saved our pennies. And we bought our first paper 11 years ago. It was a little paper called The Clarion. Um, and so if you want to kind of see our geography, if you're not familiar with Kansas, the box is kind of our area there around Wichita. Um, and then this is us now. So the clearing was our start. Um, and then and you, if you want to hear the whole saga of KPV, I, I can give it to you. But basically, we ended up expanding into having the Hillsboro Free Press. Um, you probably are familiar with Marion County, Kansas, which is where Hillsboro Free Press is uh, located. So we've had a lot of just all kinds of excitement there lately. <laughs> and then Harvey County now is our flagship now. Uh, it is a brand new paper. Well, not brand new anymore. We've been around for nine years and we launched it in competition with a gatehouse paper. And um, nowadays in Newton, where we're kind of based out of when people talk about the paper, um, they are talking about us. So it's pretty exciting to be a part of that. But outside of just the papers, we've, um, we've really tried to kind of expand our ability to sustain our newsroom. Um, it, you know, you can't just depend on advertising any longer. Our advertisers have too many streams that they can plug their money into. So our goal has been to try to figure out how to get more people to use us as their way to plug money in. So the first thing on that list there is Zen Print. Our, uh, our advertising director, Bruce, um, he actually, his, his official title in our company is Marketing Dude. If, if you look in the staff box, that's what it says. It's Bruce Beheimer, MD. And 
he uh, he's very much an old hippie, so he wanted to call it Zen Print. And Zen Print is just, um, we basically decided that we were going to try to be a one-stop shop for all of our customers. So we will broker printing. So we I just paid a bill for a bunch of like tote bags. Um, we've done zip drives for people. We've done t-shirts. We've done all kinds of stuff. And we just have developed relationships with a lot of different vendors to be able to do that for our folks. So instead of them having to figure out the best price, they just come to us, we figure it out for them, and we can give them everything that they need. Uh, the other thing that we've been playing with quite a bit is events. Um, if I look tired, it is because on Saturday this past week, we had our big flagship event, which is Blues, Brews, and Barbecue. We have a big party, basically, in our park. Um, there was a band shell there that hadn't been used in years, and we went to the city, and we were like, hey, can we, can we use that? And they were like, yeah. So we started this kind of festival. We had three different bands this year. We have beer that we sell. We bring in food trucks. We even have a special beer that is brewed just for our event uh, over in Walnut River Brewing Company in El Dorado, Kansas. It's called Off the Record Ale. Um, so it's a dunkle. It's delicious. No, I didn't bring it with me. Sorry. Um, but it's, it's kind of a fun event. Um, this year, attendance was down a little bit just because there was too many different things competing with us, but we probably had six to 800 people just hanging out listening to blues music in our park uh, on Saturday. Um, and so my feet still hurt, but it was, it was a really, really fun event. Um, we also do regular forums for political stuff, uh, you know, our can local candidates, and we've been able to get really good attendance there. And another event that we're playing with that we will probably do this spring is we want to do a Half-toberfest. So, um, you know, October's really busy, but, you know, June and May is not so bad. So we thought we'd try to get in some polka bands that are probably bored in May and also probably get one of our brewers to do some fall beers for us. And we'll do a festival for that as well. So that's our that's our new scheme that we're working on as well. Um, we've also done an event called Talk 20, which if you're familiar with like TED Talks, it's a little like that. You have tw uh, 20 slides and you have 20 seconds per slide. So it's about a seven minute presentation. And we just bring in people from all walks of life. Um, it, it kind of waned a bit now with the pandemic, but we're hoping to bring that back here soon as well. So some of these bring in a decent chunk of money. Some of them bring in absolutely nothing, but we also look at it as goodwill. And you know, it's free advertising for us to get our name out there that people associate us with there's something going on in town. Oh, Harvey County now, they're doing it. And then the other big thing that we started playing this with this, uh, this past year, we were approached by the University of Kansas to do a study. Uh, and I always said that I thought if somebody was going to study us, it would probably be some sort of psychological study. But instead, it was actually a newspaper thing. And they asked us to try some different revenue models. And one of the ideas that they wanted us to play with was e-newsletters. Uh, if you do not have an e-newsletter, highly recommend it. Uh, what we've started doing, our managing editor has really taken it on. Um, we've um, A, it gets our reporters to actually write their stories way before deadline because they want them to go in the newsletter, which as the copy editor, it works great for me. Um, but we kind of put out like a daily uh, newsletter with just links to different stories that we've been doing. It's great. You know, as a weekly, it's hard for us to get breaking news out, but now we can because we have these newsletters. Um, people just sign up. Um, we put little house ads in every so often. We put a push out on social media to start with. But really, like, our social media page has kind of just become a secondary thought now, and the newsletters are really where it's at. We get tons of clicks on it. Um, if you want me to pull up the MailChimp and look at, you know, diagnose it with you at some point, I totally would be willing to do that. Um, but we have, like, thousands of clicks that we get every week on this newsletter and our um, and Bruce has just now recently sold advertising into it. Um, so we're actually now getting to turn a profit outside of it. But the other benefit is, is we have a hard paywall. And so when people can sign up for the newsletter, whether they're a subscriber or not, but they'll hit the wall. And after they hit the wall enough times, uh, we start, especially if there's a real juicy story, we start seeing all of our subscriptions start to roll in even more, which has been really interesting. And the other big thing that we launched as a part of this study was something we called Press Club. So a year ago, we started, um, it's basically a social group. One of the things about Newton, Kansas, is there is very little to do. And so people needed something. And so we decided that we were going to do this social club. You 
paid, um, our subscription at the time was uh, $60, $60, and so you paid another $60 and you were a member of Press Club. And that got you access to all of these mingles that we did. We trade out with a local event venue so you could get free tickets to concerts. We traded out advertising with our local uh, minor league baseball team and we had Sweet Night at the Wind Surge this summer, which was pretty fun, especially because it was so hot and we were all in that air conditioned suite, so we felt very fancy. Um, we've been partnering with different businesses in town now, so they've been hosting us for mingles, and so that means they buy the beer and make the snacks, which is amazing. Um, and we've just been able to do all these like just fun things. We're getting ready this next month to do a whiskey tasting, so it's just for like 14 people. Everybody brings a bottle, and they do little pours, and then at the end of the night, everybody draws a number, and then you get to pick which bottle that you want to take home with you. Um, it's just stuff to just give people something to do. And another thing that you know I think is important is that people in our community know who we are. You know, we're a small town, but it's still amazing how many people who are like, have no idea who you are. And the more that people know their journalists, their local journalists, the more willing they are to, to support the newspaper. And so that has been not only a monetary benefit for us, but it has been a really good outreach as well. And then our other big initiative that we launched, it's actually um, a year ago in September, is called Earn Your Press Pass. Um, and that is something where um, we actually started it just for the state of Kansas. Um, we figured out that, you know, people can't recruit journalists to their rural newsrooms. Um, and even for us, we're only 30 minutes outside of downtown Wichita. Um, and Wichita is the biggest city in Kansas at like 400,000 people. So for some of you, you're like, that's huge. And for some of you, you're like, that's stinky. So uh, we were in North Dakota and everybody thought we were big city folk. And we were like, what? We are, so we were shocked. But you know, Newton's still a town of 20,000, which is pretty big for Kansas. And we could not get any like KU grads or Wichita State grads to want to come to our newsroom. We had one young lady, she like went through a bunch of the interview process with us. And then we were like, well, you know, you'll want to move to one of our towns in Harvey County. And she was like, oh no, I was just going to write for you from Lawrence, which is like three hours away. And we were like, that's not how journalism works. So she didn't pan out. Um, so what we decided was that we needed a way to be able to train community members to be able to do journalism well and also how to do it ethically. And so as with my background as a teacher, we decided to develop this online on-demand training course and that's Earn Your Press Pass. Um, and I can, I can pontificate on it all day long, but the gist of it is is that you can take these courses, you get kind of your you know triage, like quick, quick and dirty understanding of how to do journalism. It's easy for people to put their freelancers through, their part-timers, their high school intern that's coming to the office that you don't know what to do with, you can put them in front of it and get them going. And we've partnered now with, um, we actually, I just got the signed contract in my email this morning from Ohio. So we're up to 21 states. <laughs> we're up to 21 state associations that we're working with. We also have now partnered um, with INN um, and a couple other large newspaper or, um, groups that are going to use our program as well. And so that's been kind of our outreach here lately um, to be able to push community journalism. And then the last thing I want to tell you about us is that we took a huge step in July and decided that one of the ways that we were going to get more revenue from our for our paper was to get it from our readers. We started doing the math and we figured out that it cost us $3.03 to print every copy of the paper and we were selling a year subscription for $66 plus tax. Which if you do that math and I know none of us want to, so I'll just tell you, it doesn't work out. So with advertising continue to, continuing to wane, we decided, you know what, our readers are going to have to support this if they want it. And so in, in June, we published this big story, and I've got a few copies if anybody wants it, or it's also free on our website, harveycountynow.com. It's called The Cost to Print. We explained our demo, our, all of our um, costs. We explained, I mean, Joey and I put our salary in the paper. Um, so we tried to be very honest and open with our readers, and we doubled our subscription price. So as of July, our subscription went from $66 to 144 for a year in print. And we have not seen hardly any churn. It's been amazing. I expected everybody to move over to the online edition. There's been a few, but for the vast majority, they're all in on the print edition. So it's been an interesting way to kind of see how our community has, has wanted to interact with us. Um, and it was terrifying, by the way. Like, that was a lost sleep moment, but it, was, it turned out to be the right decision. So... That's kind of what we do. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. That was uh, great to hear from Lindsay and Chris. Uh, let's do another round of applause. I'm still kind of <laughs> marveling at everything that they just unpacked for us. Um, in fact, um, in fact, coming to this this summit and uh, facing the, the the task of of addressing um, a track with the title of how did they do that was daunting to me because that's a question that I ask myself every day and have been asking ever <laughs> since I, I started in journalism. And it's so cool to be here among all of these innovative uh, journalism leaders from around the country. So very, very, very inspiring. And also, um, I'm humbled by it. So my name is Tristan Scott. I live in northwest Montana. And I'm the managing editor of the Flathead Beacon, which um, was founded in 2007. So we also are not a legacy newspaper. We were the new kids on the block 16 years ago uh, when our founders uh, started a 22-page weekly tabloid in uh, the Flathead Valley, which is where we take our name. Uh, again, that's in northwest Montana located on the doorstep of Glacier National Park. At the time, uh, in 2007, there was something of a news desert, and our owners wanted something, something fresh. They wanted uh, to invest in long-form investigative journalism. Uh, there were other newspapers, two weeklies and a daily. Um, that was a part of a newspaper chain, and our, our owners thought that we could do something different. And, you know, one of the uh, one of the things that I keep hearing as a uh, as, as a thread um, for the for the last day is the notion of community engagement and just how important that is for a news organization to be connected to the community, to be interfacing with the community, and that's something that we recognized early on. We started with a staff of four twenty-something reporters and an editor um, putting the paper to, to together. Um, just ourselves, uh, and um, but we were out in the community constantly uh, engaging. That's something that's evolved through the years that I'll that I'll touch on um, as we as we get along. Um, just this year, after publishing 823 issues of a, a free weekly print edition, we transitioned to an online only daily news format. And I want to talk about that more later, but um, I will just say um, that uh, you know I, I consider that as heartbreaking as it was uh, to discontinue our print edition, having a committed readership that's followed us along through that uh, transition has been one of the most heartening things I've experienced in my career because it shows to me that we did what we set out to prove, prove which is to build these sustainable relationships with our readers um, and who trust us and who, who trust us to fairly tell the stories from their community. Um, so just in the last six months, this is a relatively new transition. I've been, uh, I've been emboldened by that ongoing support. Our newsroom, again, is located um, in northwest Montana on the doorstep of Glacier National Park. It's a really cool place to live and to work. And um, so in order to, uh, to instill that, um, we've, we've, we've sort of um, recruited um, very talented, experienced journalists who come to work for the Flathead Beacon because they want to live in the communities that we cover. Um, we, were, we, we have a, a, a cool office in downtown Kalispell on a main street that reminds me a lot of Keens. Uh, we've got a pool table and a kegerator, and we regularly hold events with our readers to just sort of hobnob and um, let them meet the people who are covering issues that are critical to them. Um, I think that's gone a long ways towards our retention, which is something we've had very little turnover through the years. I've been there 10 years. My boss, uh, editor-in-chief Kellen Brown, is one of the founders. He's been there for 16 years. And our reporting staff has all been there for between five and seven years. And we think a big reason for that is not just because we can fairly compensate them, which we can, uh, although that's all, it's all relative, but it's because uh, we give them ski passes. Uh, we, uh, if there's a powder day, we let uh, a couple reporters peel off to go ride the chairlift for a morning. And that 
you know, that doesn't help the bottom line, but it goes a long way to boosting morale, to preventing burnout, um, which I think most people here can probably identify with. And um, as I hear, as I hear some of my, my colleagues and new friends talk about having to peel away to finish reporting a story or to put the paper to bed, as in Lindsay's case, um, I think we can all identify with that and, and recognize that it goes a long way to feeling supported and to feeling like your livelihood matters outside of uh, outside of journalism. Now, as I said, we started as a weekly print newspaper with a staff of five. Um, we have since evolved into a staff of about 20. Uh, we have a, a eight people uh, who are part of our editorial team. That includes uh, myself, managing editor, my boss, the editor-in-chief, a full-time photographer, and five full-time reporters. Now, the rest of our company is filled out by a staff that comprises an advertising department, a digital marketing, marketing department, and then a web development and graphic design department. And so we, uh, although still rely on, even in our digital only format, advertising as our primary revenue stream, we, uh, we all have diversified um, where uh, digital marketing, web development, graphic design has increasingly become some of our most profitable sectors and divisions. And that's helped us not um, we, we've not made any cuts to our newsroom. In fact, we've remained stable for 16 years with the addition of two, uh, two new reporter positions. And so we've, we've only grown, and although that might sound modest to, um, to some of you from larger markets, uh, in our market, especially with the, with the presence of other, uh, of other newspapers, it's actually quite robust. Uh, I mentioned that we're located in downtown Kalispell, uh, the gateway to Glacier National Park. I keep saying that because um, our proximity to Glacier National Park and the natural resources as well as amenities are why people choose to live and, and visit Northwest Montana. And so a lot of our coverage is focused on Glacier Park um, and so are uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our photography. Um, but we also uh, cover um, outlying communities, including two Native American reservations um, and uh, outlying uh, counties near the Canadian border. Our um, sort of, the, our region that we, uh, the Flathead Valley is about 100,000 people, um, and, uh, but we do tell a lot of stories outside of that. And I think that's become important to our reader, our readership and our, our reader base is that they, they know that they're going to get stories from, from the hinterlands, from these tiny um, unincorporated communities that don't have their own newspapers and that don't otherwise get a lot of coverage. And I'll tell you that that's where, uh, that, that's where you know, there's just, a, there's, as they say, a thousand naked stories and a thousand stories in the naked city, and um, they just need to be, they need, need to be unearthed. So we give uh, our reporters a lot of freedom to spend some shoe leather and go spend a couple of days in those outlying communities without any real objective, just to see what kind of, what kind of stories they can unearth. So the print to digital transition, it's not an original story at this point, but um, you know, it, it was a, a really hard decision to make. And I've always, ever since I started in journalism in 2004, sort of saw the inevitability that print was, um, that print was dying this, uh, this inevitable death. I did not want to be the one uh, to have to make the decision and actually have to discontinue a print edition when it did, uh, when it did seem like that was, um, that was the best course. Um, I again was fearful that uh, that we were going to lose readers, that they were um, that they were not going to follow us online, that they were not going to subscribe to our e-newsletter, and that has not been the case. The support has been overwhelming, and although I've spent a lot of time presenting to the fraternal orders of the Moose Lodge and uh, various pachyderm clubs and trying to get especially some of our senior readers to understand why this transition was necessary in order to ensure our sustainability, but that it can also be um, a, an advantage in terms of freeing up certain resources that we were, that we were using to publish the newspaper uh, in order to do more investigative enterprise projects. And once they heard that, and once we explained to them, here's what's happened, here's how much money we were losing, here's what happened during COVID, um, we're, we're shrinking the newspaper um, by 20 pages per year, um, they, they really started to get it. And uh, the other thing that has been a real advantage during that time is to uh, onboard those readers to an e-newsletter. And we've built subscriptions exceeding 6,000. And that's really important because not only has that 
helped us generate some additional advertising revenue, but it really gives us an opportunity to share our independent voices with our readers, um, and it provides sort of a, a blueprint to, uh, to our, our online presentation, which uh, can be quite confusing for people who are used to having a weekly tabloid. Um, they know exactly, uh, exactly how much news they're going to get, where to find it. And frankly, that's been the biggest challenge for our newsroom because the print edition was, in many ways, our guiding star. Um, it was, uh, it was a, a very finite container. You had to fill the news hole, and beyond that, um, there, there wasn't a whole lot of, of wiggle room. Now, it turns out the Internet's a, a, a vast space, and I think for the first few months, um, as we looked to try and, try and determine our metabolism and pacing for how much content to release, we sort of, uh, we sort of spazzed out and just wanted to you know, throw, <laughs> throw biscuits at the wall and see what stuck. And it took us a few weeks, a few months to really reestablish our identity, get centered again, realize that what people wanted and what they expected for us were these in-depth, long-form story to us, the uh, investigative storytelling, as well as um, coverage of the uh, crosstown prep sports rivalry between the Columbia Falls Wildcats and the Whitefish Bulldogs. Um, and so that kind of community journalism mixed with uh, a kind of storytelling that's quite rarefied in, in Northwest Montana, I think has, uh, has proven to readers that, um, that we have something that they're not going to get in, in other markets. I, although we no longer print a weekly newspaper, we do still print. And um, our flagship product is Flathead Living Magazine, which is a quarterly lifestyle magazine. Um, you can see uh, in the photos here, uh, at the center is our spring, uh, spring edition of Flathead Living. Um, we, um, I think any day now, we'll be receiving the fall edition of Flathead Living. The cover story of that is, um, is a story about the Blackfeet Nation uh, releasing a herd of, uh, of wild free roaming bison onto uh, their reservation lands abutting Glacier National Park. It's a, it was a historic moment for the tribe as well as for resource managers uh, and, and really for the country. And we put that on the cover of the magazine. And, and that was as much a, a recognition that this was an important story as well as um, a statement that you know this this magazine isn't just an advertorial. It's not. Um, it doesn't just cater to the real estate market. We want to tell stories from from all corners as well as underrepresented communities. Um, and so that was really important to us. Um, that said, the Flathead Living magazine is uh, an important uh, source of revenue for us, and um, and so we we use that as our primary vehicle for advertising. We also publish an annual guide to Glacier National Park and the surrounding area called Glacier Journal. Again, it is not just a, uh, your typical tourism guide. It's a, it's a field guide to enjoying the park and the surrounding area, but also uh, an unpacking of uh, issues, sustainability issues, etiquette that, um, that have befallen the park in recent years as visitation has, and overcrowding have gotten out of hand. Um, and we've seen our local communities transformed by affordability crises accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, you know, we, we certainly um, keep those, those issues um, at, at the center of our coverage, even, um, even as we're trying to appeal to what's often a transient readership, um, especially with Glacier Journal. That is, that's a, a periodical that, um, is, um, that caters to our visitors. I mentioned our, our e-newsletter, and um, I, I'm sure that, um, that there's going to be a surge in e-newsletter subscriptions after this conference, because I know that I've already subscribed to a few new ones just because I want to um, read them like a thief and see what everybody else is doing. <laughs> um, but uh, the way that we've structured it is somewhat unique in that each day of the week, uh, a different reporter from our newsroom generates the, the e-newsletter. And we start with an introduction um, that is often 
um, maybe an anecdote about um, about a, a day spent uh, fly fishing on one of our local tributaries, or um, or you know a photo of our dogs. We uh, we've got, we've got a dog friendly office, and so but that kind of uh, sharing those kinds of personal interests and anecdotes, I think, goes a long way toward connecting with our readers. Um, and then we um, uh, we uh, have several other sections, including data points, um, quotables from the archives. Um, and all of that, again, provides sort of a roadmap for our readers to explore, familiarize themselves with our website, um, as well as to just get a sense of who's covering their communities. Um, we, as I said, have built that into a, a subscription base of about 6,000, and it's growing, um, it's growing by the week, it, it really is. Um, th these are some examples of our, our print edition, um, which, uh, um, we still, as I said, ha employ a full-time photographer, but it was an extremely visual, uh, a, a visual um, tabloid, and we've continued to um, to maintain that aesthetic on our website, um, which has been really important. I don't think I would have been as confident making this transition to online only if we didn't have such uh, such a styly website. We've, uh, in the last three years, three consecutive years, won best website. Um, from by from the uh, uh, Montana Newspaper Association, and we're very proud of that. We beat out the state's largest daily newspapers, um, which are all owned by a corporation, and um, so it's all just boilerplate boilerplate websites. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, and you know, the the reason I mentioned that is. Um, because I think our being owned independently has been probably the biggest secret to the to our being able to answer the question of how do we do that? Um, because we've had the freedom to exercise ideas, implement them, um, and and put them into action, and without the fear of uh, retribution, uh, profit-driven retribution. And um, without the fear of failing, uh, we've failed a lot, and uh, a lot of our initiatives ha haven't always worked out. I used to lead a running club, um, which was really fun for a couple of years. We got all kinds of people gathering at our office, interested in what we do, going for evening jogs. It uh, it was a, a fast trajectory toward burnout because I would finish reporting and editing at five o'clock, and then there would be twenty people wanting me to lead them on a run. And um, <laughs> so, although it was a great idea, we just didn't have the resources to sustain it. But I'm really glad that we tried it and um, and we built a lot of new relationships by trying it. But you know, I started my journalism career working for one of the state's large daily newspapers. And um, and I, I don't I, I was ready to leave journalism until I found um, until I found the Flathead Beacon, which uh, really stood out as a unicorn newspaper to me at the time. Now that I'm here, I'm realizing that there are many, many unicorns in this world, and um, this is such a wonderful opportunity to uh, cross horns and uh, <laughs> ex exchange ideas. But I, I really do think that you know the, uh, any measure of success that we've had. Um, has been due to our independence. Um, and so I hope we can um, celebrate that a little bit this week. Uh, thank you all for, for listening to me. So I'd like to throw it out to, I've got some questions, but I would like to prioritize what your questions might be of, of, of these excellent presentations and presenters. So. I can almost see people. There's one. Yes. Uh, Charles, what's your, uh, sort of can we get a mic to you? Because we are recording this. I can be louder. Uh, <laughs> Travis, um, what is the uh, population of the area that you're serving? Thanks for the question. It's it's actually Tristan and our. I'm so sorry. That's okay. And our our population is a little bit nebulous because um, we are we're headquartered in a city that's about the same size as Keene. It's about twenty thousand people, twenty four thousand people, but then our county, Flathead County, is a hundred thousand people, and then some of those outlying communities add an additional ten thousand. Um, so it's a, a fairly wide reach. When we distributed a weekly news a print edition, it was uh, 25,000 copies. And our niche publications, including that quarterly magazine, are about 25,000. Uh, Terry, I have a, a, a oh, question, too. Go ahead. Yeah, Jack Rooney from the Sentinel, Radically Rural. Um, uh, 
Uh, Chris and Tristan, you guys have both talked about uh, niche publications and how those kind of help power the daily journalism as well. Um, I'm curious, for those niche publications, is do you have freelancers? Is that a separate staff? Do you have newsroom staff who does that? Uh, are we, we have freelancers. For the most part, it's all freelancers. Um, for our Traditionis event, we do have the staff do, doing it because they really want to get involved with the unsungs. But overall, it's stringers. And we don't buy anything syndicate. Everything's locally generated. The only thing that we have that's not in our paper that's syndicate is the New York Times crossword puzzle. Everything is local. <laughs> Yeah, we, we do have a small freelance budget um, that I use primarily for Flathead Living Magazine because those stories are more in-depth and complicated, both, um, both in their narrative as well as visual style. However, um, we, most, of the, most of the content is produced in-house. Um, again, I have some, some columnists who I pay a modest freelance budget to contribute, but it's mostly in-house and that really makes the, um, that's made the magazine feel more of an extension of our print legacy than I think it would otherwise because our reporters are so invested in it and they really care now um, about the story because they don't have as many opportunities to see their, their, their bylines in print and to, to get that nice, nice ego massage that we all crave. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Thank you for this excellent presentation. And uh, as a resident of Key, <coughs> pardon my laryngitis, and as a resident of the area now for 48 years, with the Keene Sentinel having been around for 224 years, could I ask Terry to be giving a one, two, or three minute summary of the current trends for the Keene Sentinel? Um, over our years here, it has uh, certainly decreased in the size of the pages and the number of the pages, but it still remains a, a very vital force for the community. Thank you in advance. I should probably have you give our, uh, <laughs> our future. Um, so many of you know that in the last few years, we've pivoted to asking the community for more support um, this has occurred both in terms of kind of like Lindsay's anecdote about increasing the price of the, of the paper um, in order to support the newsroom. And the revenue from that has been poured back into the newsroom. Um, we've, we've hired, I think, three, three, either, yeah, I think we've hired three new people over that relatively short period of time, including a state house reporter. Um, and so we look at the Sentinel as a community service. That's been Tom Ewing's priority. Um, to be a good community service, you've got to have a newsroom of some significant size and breadth and, and experience. And so the path that we're on is to figure out a way to sustain that. Um, the, the, we have seen through hedge fund ownership and corporate ownership markets in which um, papers have just shrunk to nothing. Um, the paper that I was at before I came to Keene, the National Telegraph, has a newsroom that's about a third the size of ours for a city of 90,000. So that's just not a recipe for success in our opinion. Um, it is challenging to be successful in, in a small market um, with advertising choices being as diverse as they are. Um, however, um, we think that readers will support good work. Um, they'll support um, thoughtful journalism. They will support a, a news organization that um, um, supports the community. And so that's kind of our recipe. So we're, I'm anxious to see how it turns out. Um, but I, I would say you should expect um, continued support of our newsroom. Um, but we're going to be asking for help to do that. So I'm a political activist, and I'm wondering whether you endorse candidates. 
I will just say that we uh, we don't endorse candidates. We never have. That was a decision that uh, that Cal and my boss made. Initially, we live in an extremely conservative county, um, flanked by sort of um, little bastions of progressivism that um, makes our uh, makes it. Uh, a complicated endeavor to to cover the politics of it, but much less complicated if our very small, intimate editorial staff isn't um, sort of at the at the vanguard of of making those endorsements. And so, you know, we we don't touch those. We have a robust um, uh, exchange of ideas in our op-ed pages, and um, and we leave it there. We endorse all candidates, all races, and all through our area. We, we do not do endorsements, um, but we do have an incredibly um, strong opinion page that we make sure policy, yes, but people know. <laughs> yeah. So I, this is related, but not related, uh, but mainly related. I think everybody in the room cares about the future of our planet and all of the beings on it, both two-legged and four-legged and all sentient beings. And I really want to make a pitch to everybody in the room, and particularly the people running radically rural, no more bottled water. <laughs> Tell people to bring their own water. Smart people like everybody in this room here, we should not be offering it or consuming it. Thank you for letting me make an unpaid political advertisement. <laughs> I think the Flathead Beacon's going to endorse this guy. Actually. <laughs> well, I, I feel I feel I feel sufficiently scolded. <laughs> Carolina. Uh, yeah, this this question is for Chris. Um, how long does it take you to go when you when you create a new product? How long does it take you to go from ideation? until launching the product. And um, because it's like, you have like so many different things, for example, the lantern, the lantern water or the, or the map. And can you, can you talk a bit about the capacity that it takes besides the freelancers? And uh, like, if you have a sales team for that, or this kind of thing, thank you. So, so, so I think the question is, do I have a sales team that puts, puts everything together? Is that, is that what? No, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the question is, how long does it take you to go from like getting an idea, for example, for the map oh, or a new magazine until you launch the product? Uh, I, I want to know like how long does it take oh, how long to does, launch how long to calculate how much it is. The, the sales cycle for each one of these products, basically. So, yeah, the map's interesting in which I have actually summer interns that do it. And... Um, they come in for the summer. They sell. We, we, are, we have a robust summer season, so they come in, in May and they leave at right before school starts, and we pay them. They get paid pretty well. I mean, for a, a college um, intern from from Mexico State or University of New Mexico, um, and uh, they make roughly twenty three, twenty four dollars an hour, and they have college credit, which is great. And they afterwards, I think, is really kind of neat. As they said. Well, what'd you do all summer? So we don't have them make coffee. We don't make them make copies or anything like that. They they do the map, and so if they're interested in marketing or journalism, and they want to get their fit their feet in the door. This is a great product, a great way. This is you know they sold seventy five thousand dollars worth of revenue, and so I think that's a great great thing to put on their resume. So for everything we sell, it has months in advance um, our land water people time. That takes about three months before it actually hits the press. Chris, if you, if you were thinking about a new product development, how long would it take to go from the actual idea generation to you finally getting it out the door? Um, it depends on the size. I mean, our summer guide, uh, we start selling it in January. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's, it's huge and it's perfect bound and, and such, but uh, yeah, we'll start selling in January and comes out in May. So that has a huge time limit. Um, something smaller which, uh, let's say, land water, land water people time, that's probably two or three months ahead of time. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Um, the question's for Tristan. So you're going through the transition from, you know, 
the weekly cadence. You talked about having what's nice about a weekly newspaper is you got a thing you got to put out, you got to put stuff in it, right? And so everything changes whenever you're trying to move on sort of a continuous schedule. I'm curious to hear where you landed with that. I mean, especially in terms of like if you're doing a lot of in-depth or enterprise journalism that's often long burn. I mean, how are you filling your website then, right? I mean, are you doing a weekly cadence, but it, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, <laughs> each day becomes a new week? I mean, how does that work? Yeah, thanks for the question, Christian. I think, um, you know, when we've always sort of branded ourselves as a print weekly, but an online daily. And so we were doing, you know, we were doing a lot of online, daily online coverage already. Um, and we had the, we had the, re the resources as well as the journalistic experience and expertise to, you know, put out the weekly newspaper and then pivot to a big developing story. For example, um, you know, one of our, one of our local lawmakers, Ryan Zinke was um, tabbed as uh, uh, Donald Trump's interior secretary. And so that was huge news and we led the coverage and dominated the coverage of that for weeks and months, including the many um, investigations into his uh, brief scandal plagued tenure. And so we, we sort of, we had that, we had that cadence dialed. What happened was when we, um, when we discontinued the weekly print edition, we just, we lost that sort of, we, we always had a reserve after putting out the print edition on Monday, we then trickle, you know, we just slow released the stories online throughout the week. And so every day we had a, a story, either a hard news story or a feature length story that was gonna anchor our website that day. And then around that we introduced um, content via our daily reporting or through content sharing relationships that we have through some of our nonprofit partners, including the Montana Free Press, which um, shares its content with all of the, uh, the, the state's larger news organizations. Um, and so we've just continued to, um, to sort of uh, use that that blend, but um, you know, to your point about continuing to um, ha meet readers' expectations for the enterprise journalism, we still, you know, every Wednesday morning we publish a, co a cover story and we brand it as as a cover story, so that our weekly readers um, who got you know really accustomed to that uh, to that schedule still know to tune in on a Wednesday to read our you know, what might be a 4,000 word investigation into dark money in politics. Um, and politics. Uh, and then we have an outdoors feature on Thursday and an arts feature on Friday as we head into the weekend. And so we've sort of brought what, um, what was a very consistent weekly format to our online presentation. And we adhere to that as closely as possible with some exceptions, but we basically just built a Google Doc calendar around that um, that schedule, and so although it's taken reporters some time to to, to um, I think shed the trauma of the the hard print deadline. I know I have. I mean, for ten years that you know, talk about the Sunday scaries. Every single Sunday, I knew that the next day I was going to have to put out that print edition, and it was uh, it was a it was a huge lift. And so, um, to some extent, it's nice to be able to distribute that uh, that that deadline tension throughout the week. I hope that answers your question, Christian. Yes, I think right here. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Craycraft, and this question is for Lindsay. Did I get that right? Yeah. Um, could you talk a bit more about the demographics that participate in your Earn a Press Pass program and um, how you recruit participants or how they recruit you if they're beating down the doors to join? <laughs> So we uh, we originally designed it. Um, my husband was on the he was the president of the Kansas Press Association, and they were trying to figure out how to do some sort of training. They approached the University of Kansas, Kansas State, and Wichita State, and all of those universities were basically like, "Yeah, we'll enroll them all in classes, and they can come to campus." And we were like, the, "Some of these people are in Western Kansas, where they're almost in Colorado. Like they're not driving all the way to the other side of the state for this." And so he came home and was frustrated. And we started talking about it and decided that you know if we can't find somebody else to do it, why don't we just do it? Because that's how we roll. 
Um, and so we had originally designed it as to be a member benefit for the Kansas Press Association. And when our press director went to her press association, you know, conference, she started talking to other press directors and they were like, what do you have? Can we have that? And so then it just kind of, we had to figure out a pricing model. And so what we started with was selling it to just press associations and saying, hey, like make this a member benefit. We don't want to charge, you know, try to find each individual newspaper or people that want to launch a newspaper all over the country. Let's just start with this being a member benefit. And so we had Wisconsin and Texas signed on like really, really early. They were our early adopters. And then it's just kind of spread and spread since then. Um, and then we've started then having other groups that have come to us and said, well, well, we aren't necessarily a press association, but could we maybe still work with you guys? And so that's kind of, we've kind of started big and now we're kind of moving down to, you know, if, if there's an individual group that wants it, we'll sell it to them. We've had some high schools that have approached us. Um, we actually just got an email from some guy that lives in France who was like, could we put this into French? And I'm like, <coughs> maybe. Um, so it's been kind of interesting to just kind of see the trajectory of it. But really it was literally us just being like, well, let's train some journalists in Kansas. And now you know, there's people all over the country that are, are watching it. I'm having a hard time seeing, so thank you, Jenny. Appreciate it. Follow-up question for you, Lindsay. So as you've seen your demographic grow for that product, is there any change that you've made to its content? Or, or, um, I guess I'm curious about what the content looks like, whether it's like interactive videos that you're updating on some kind of regular schedule or, or just kind of the general cadence and, and format that that takes. Yeah, so it really is just basic high school journalism if you wanna like boil it down. So I mean, it goes from like interviewing techniques to you know, all of the terminology that, that newsrooms throw around. You know, people have no idea what the heck a cut line is. And so they, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and I have my, I have grand illusions and it's going to happen this year now to actually start developing more um, because it exploded so hard. We haven't had as much time. You know, we still have the full-time job with all the papers. Um, but I have an entire list of videos that I want to add. Um, the major format, most of the videos are well under 15 minutes. The longest ones are in the ethics section and that was because I got nervous. And so I, I explained it real hard. Um, and also kept saying, you can't, don't, don't just trust me. Keep, you know, ask your editor because I'm not going to get sued with you. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's it's all really just me like doing like just kind of basic like let me just tell you about this type video stuff. Um, I tried to keep it light and um, not too bogged down. There aren't any quizzes. There isn't you know there's no homework out you know outside of then you have to go like write an article. Um, so I tried to really you could sit down and watch the entire thing in a day. Um, 2.0, we'll have some more videos. We're gonna call it the extra credit section, um, and um, and then 2.0 five, whatever. I don't, we're also going to do a sales training, um, version of earn your press pass because we found that that's also been really hard for people to get, you know, that. And then we've also talked about adding a class where, how do you, how do you launch a publication and where we would just kind of talk about some of the pitfalls that we fell into, you know, getting postal permits and all that kind of stuff, or, you know, what, what do I need to do if I want to actually be a newspaper? So the goal is, is that this is going to continue to develop and, and add. Um, but so far it's mostly just been us just adding people and not adding as much content, but pretty soon, um, that's my next big project is to start adding some more videos. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I have a hard time seeing. Thank you. Um, so this is totally sort of away from the journalistic um, component. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context, I'm from an arts organization, so that's where my questing is being sourced from. Um, can you speak to the value of um, a quarterly newsletter um, and also news happening now versus news that you are, you are going to be um, something that is going to happen in the future um, and the value of, of that, those two together, please? Anyone? I, I think it's all of the above. Uh, we promote ahead of an event. If we had an event or a section coming out, we, we promote it the day of. And then we promote what has happened. And then breaking news, we constantly, that's, that's our bread and butter. 
uh, when we have a breaking news, it's up immediate, as quick as we can. But yeah, it's before, the, the, and if we know something's happening, obviously, this is, we have, if we have a special section, we promote the heck, heck out of it before, during, and after. But if a ba major news event, and we know something's happening, or if someone's coming into town that's been important, this is coming up, this, these are the details that he or she's arrived, and this is what happened. So we do a, a, as much as we can throughout, and then everything obviously is shared on social media channels. That's, that's part of it. Yeah, our, our, our arts and culture coverage is a mix of uh, yeah. event previews, um, gallery openings, um, as well as artist profiles and uh, sort of community features. Um, I will say that we, that we have one person covering arts and entertainment. Um, he is always overwhelmed with, um, with events. And so certainly having, you know, it, you know, he, he, with that limited bandwidth, he needs all of the advance notice that he can get um, in order to prioritize a certain event as well as a reason to prioritize it. So I know that sort of the, um, the best success are the event organizers who, you know, really are prepared to, to pitch a story and tell us why that story ought to be told. But, um, uh, but yeah, certainly, art, certainly arts and culture is a, is a huge part of our, our coverage. We are Hi, way up, up there. Um, my name is Emma Doyle. I'm from a small but very mighty publication on the Outer Cape called the Provincetown Independent. Um, thanks for the fist bump. Uh, so I have a question from like the business side of things for your supplemental publications. Um, we just started publishing our first supplementals about a year ago. We've done two. We're about to do three. Do you have any uh, hard learned lessons that you would like to share with someone who's sort of beginning the foray into that and learning our own lessons along the way, but um, some of you have some really robust supplemental publications and magazines, and just curious if there's one thing that you would like to sort of tell a newcomer to say, definitely do this and definitely don't do that. Thank you. Um, uh, what I've seen, the biggest sin from newspaper publishers is they lie about their circulation. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and they think our clients are not aware of that. And that is, I mean, I've had such a really, I print in Denver and publication, all my stuff. And unfortunately, or unfortunately, I pretty much know, I, something will come in our market and I'll ask my print rep, he goes, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but they're only printing 3,000 copies or 5,000, but they're saying 10. Um, and I, I, I think we, a lot of publishers hedge on this and I, it, it drives me nuts. It's like our, the most important thing I can tell anybody in this room is don't lie about your circulation. If you print 235,000 copies of that map, print 235 copies of that map, I spend roughly 10 to 15,000 with a third party vendor that I hate, but I want to make sure that product's out there. And, you know, we, I think we all put it on social media, we all do email blasts, but don't lie about your circulation. I've seen more papers get in trouble because it gets out. And if they don't see people coming in with the product and they don't see results, they, they, they know it. And it eventually gets out. And so I could have a whole seminar just on circulation because it's so important. And it's our biggest sin in this industry is we lie about our circulation. We, we don't do what we say we're going to do. Um, if they're paying $4,000 for a full page ad in my publication, they expect the circulation. So I, I, I'll get off that. But it just it's huge. Uh, the biggest pitfall many publishers get into, and it, it, it drives me nuts. I would say um, when you're when in looking at printing is get a lot of bids. Um, I've seen some people go to the first bid, and I go, what, why are you paying that? You could, you know, and they'll, they'll work with you. Different places will, and I hate to say pit one against each other, but kind of pit one against each other. Try to get the best price. <laughs> uh, don't go to the first person you see, um, and then you, you can talk to them and say, well, why don't, why don't I just put cheaper stock inside and, and heavier stock outside. You, there's all kinds of things you can do. You don't need to be perfect bound. You can do stitch, trim, the way it's put together. So anyway, there's a lot of, if I can help you later on, but there's a lot of pitfalls I've, <laughs> I've fallen in the last 30 years or whatever. So it's just, just circulation I keep on talking about. <laughs> it's important. Yes. Hello, um, I'm Liz Gotthelp. I'm a founder, publisher, Socket by News, a small uh, independent online news source in southern Maine, cover three. Um, 
communities. And I, let me tell you, this is very inspiring because I'm kind of at the point where I realized I need to diversify my um, revenue if I want to keep paying my mortgage and eating and things like that that I like to do. Um, no question. pressure. <laughs> right, right. Uh, question for you. Um, what is the best sort of swag that people like and that will kind of promote your brand? Beer koozies. <laughs> <laughs> We, we put together t-shirts that say Harvey County now on the front and then the back says, I support local journalism. And um, we've bought, bought a whole bunch of them. Um, we still have a lot. If you wear a large, large size, especially, let me know. Um, but we've just kind of, we kind of, when we'd have somebody come in to pay for their subscription, if they were like pontificating about how much the paper were like, what size, what size t-shirt do you wear? And so you, we see them around town all the time, which is really cool. Our slogan is, if, if you live here, you get it. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask one final question, and um, I would like all of you to talk a little bit about it. Um, one of the themes that I've picked up from your presentations has been the manner in which you try to connect the community. And Chris, in your case, you've got a very diversified line of publications that, that I think serve a varied and diverse population that you have. And in, um, and in uh, Tristan's case, the, the focus on what seems to be one of the number one interests in, in your region, and that is the environment in which you're in, because that's why folks are locating there. And in Lindsay's case, um, you know, filling a, a, a hole, you know, a, um, communities that were not being served properly with local news now are. So I'd be very interested to hear from you what, what the reaction is to the community, to your efforts, how they, how they um, respond to you, how they make you um, aware of their appreciation of what you're doing or, or not. So how, how do you define that relationship that you've been able to build within your community? Well, one of the ways that we've, um, that we've sort of you know, continue to burnish those relationships with the community is um, by starting, and I don't think I mentioned this earlier, a membership club um, that is donation based and helps um, support independent local journalism. Um, we've really found that by, um, you know, giving readers the opportunity to support local journalism that they've um, actually kind of been wondering, um, wondering where that opportunity has been all along. Um, we, we do offer our, our online content for free. There's no paywall. We also don't charge subscriptions or fees for our magazines, and our, our print edition was always free uh, as well. But having that, uh, that opportunity, giving readers an opportunity to support the Flathead Beacon by joining what we call the Editor's Club has been not only uh, a materially substantial uh, revenue generator, but it's also been um, just a really cool um, cohesion of, of readers. And um, we've kind of built upon it by hosting regular events, um, the likes of which I've heard, I've heard a lot of examples from my colleagues here. Um, but um, once a year, we, uh, we, we charter a boat to take our members out on Flathead Lake, which is the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi, kind of a big deal in Northwest Montana. Um, and, uh, and we hire a live band and uh, we just mix it up. I mean, I'm kind of amazed at, um, you know, I've been, doing, I've been doing community journalism for 18 years, so uh, it's not all that exotic to me, but when you are visiting with your readers who only know you by your byline and only know you um, as, a, as a storyteller, they are fascinated in what it's like to, to be a reporter. And so I've found that sharing more examples, uh, human examples of what it's like to cover our communities, our politics, our cultures, has gone a long ways to instilling confidence and, um, and commitment amongst our, our readers. Chris, how about you? Um, we do a lot of outreach with, with our readers. One, one thing that we've always done is coffee with the editor. I'll have someone that's madder than a hornet and they're mad about 
whatever. And I said, well, you need to talk to the editor. And if something positive, they talk to me. No, I'm just kidding. But it, <laughs> if, if I have someone, I said, why don't you meet me with our editor? Why don't you have a cup of coffee? We have a thing, a little ad in the paper that says, have coffee with the editor. And like, well, I can have coffee. Yes, please meet with the editor. And you can have coffee with me um, at any time. And, you know, I'm at the Lions Club, I'm at the Rotary, and all these different functions. And that's probably the best thing is they know they can spend 10 minutes with the editor and just, and I, I tell my, my editor, he goes, I don't want to meet. I can't do it. It's not my, it's not my thing. It's your thing. I said, no, it's your thing too. It's real important. It's more your thing than my thing. I said, you don't have to agree with them. You don't have to say you're going to run whatever, whatever it may be. Just listen. I think if you just listen, have a cup of coffee, give them 10 minutes, give them 15 minutes. We'll buy the coffee. And we'll go to lunch if you need to. Whatever, if you have someone that vocal and that upset, and they're going to tell 20 people how much they hate the Taos News, why not just sit down? And then they, afterwards, they go, wow, they, they actually had a coffee with me. It was kind of cool. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing. And every focus group we have, we try to get people that are, uh, or I say radical, <laughs> people that are really uh, very upset. And I, we have them a part of our focus group. It's good that they're part of it. They're not, we're not just picking our advertisers or people that love the Taos News, people that really are not too happy, but we pepper them in with other people. And that seems to be, to go a long ways. Thanks, Chris. Lindsay. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just being a part of, part of the community, which, you know, if you're a community journalist, that's just part, you know, that's part of the gig. Um, for us, um, the press club has been amazing because it's, it's kind of let down the walls. Like people feel weird just walking into a newsroom because, you know, there's like nothing to buy in there really outside of a subscription. So, you know, it's like one of those weird storefronts that you walk past and you're like, I wonder what's in there, but I'm not brave enough to try see. And so it gets people in our, in our building and they actually can, you know, hang out. Um, we also try to make sure we're going to lots of those local events just as participants as well. Um, um, and we, we also have Beer Fridays, so um, if you're ever in Newton, Kansas, and you want to come join us, it's about 3 o'clock on Friday. Everybody stops working, um, except for me normally, but everybody else. And we just sit in the back room, and we drink beers, and we'll have people just kind of show up. And it's been amazing to kind of see. Um, there was one day that our former press association director was in town, so he was sitting back there. Uh, a guy that uh, organizes our local fe summer festival was sitting there, and the head of our Republican Party was sitting there, and they were all just drinking beers with our journalists and hanging out and um, in, we always say everything's off the record back here in the back room let's just hang out and chat um, and our you know the head of our Republican Party regularly tells people when they're mad at us just say just go talk to them they're just normal guys don't don't worry about it like just go talk to them they're, they're people and I think that's been that's kind of been you know our, our goal is to have these events and to just be present to say, you know, look, we're not some highfalutin group of you know overly educated overly liberal folk we're just like, normal people that care about this community regardless of political affiliation or whatever like we just want this community to thrive and so i think that when people know that then they're willing to continue to write that check to you every year so that wraps up our first session for today i really want to thank chris and lindsay and tristan for all the thought all the thought that they put into these presentations and for your questions too. I thought they were extremely ins insightful and I, and I learned a great deal. Um, if you're going to stay with us, and I hope you are, um, there is a bag, there are bag lunches out there, go grab one, but come back. Um, <laughs> because right around 12.45, we're gonna start the next session, which I'm very excited about sharing with all of you folks. So, thank you. <laughs>